Silk Lab, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much, John, for inviting me. I'm, it's really a pleasure to be on your podcast. It is a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, it is morning in Utah for me. It is evening for you in Dubai. Uh, you're joining me from halfway across the world. It's a, really a pleasure to be with you. Today, we're going to be focusing on five core elements of human potential. Now, of course, this has relevance uh, in all aspects of life, in our personal life, our family life, our community life, but it also has direct implications for the workplace and how we lead our teams, how we fulfill our potential as leaders, but also how we support and, and help uh, our people fulfill their potential as well. So we're going to unpack all that and have a nice conversation today. As we get started, I wanted to share Silk's bio with everybody. Silk Lab is a performance and well-being advisor and executive coach. In the last 10 years, she has coached and trained high-performing executives and entrepreneurs around the globe to resolve the mysterious mental challenges of burnout, motivation, and resilience. She works with leaders who need support in a business role or role transition and energy boost or a revitalization of energies uh, or a new outlook on life and work. Her unique brain boss method crystallizes five core elements of human potential. Neuro uh, I'll let you outline those for us in a moment, just because yeah. I'm afraid I might <laughs> mess up the pronunciation. She trains practical skills and unpacks and fine tunes mental models to produce the outcome you want. And I could go on and on and on about your bio, but what a tremendous background. You do some really important work. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? Yeah, very, very quickly. So for my profession, I am actually a psychologist. I have a master's degree in psychology. And then I picked up all kinds of uh, coaching credentials, neuro-linguistic programming, clinical hypnotherapy, systemic work. You also had one, someone who did rapid transformation therapy. I, I also have, a, I attended a course in this, behavior analysis. Yeah, all kinds of things, applied neuroscience to really offer something for the five core agility points of human potential. Be, because in the end, well, what you also said, it's a more holistic approach. And everybody is different. The situation someone is in is also different. And therefore, uh, all these different credentials to, to help really people at their best. Wonderful. Thank you for that additional professional background. Clearly, you are very qualified, uh, have a lot of credentials and a lot of skills in this area. So now let's go ahead and unpack the five core elements of human potential. And we can start to dissect that and really dig into each of those. Can you lay those out for us? And then we can start uh, moving into each one. Yes. So the five elements are agility points. And the first one is neurological agility. Then we have emotional agility, mental agility, social agility and spiritual agility. So these are the five core ones. Do you want me to start with the first one? Which yeah, let's one go ahead and there? dive right on into the first one. Um, and I appreciate you, you framing it in terms of agility. I think that's also uh, a very helpful way of understanding potential and growth and development. Yeah. So our, uh, anything what we are doing, feeling, acting out is all directed by the brain. So if your brain, if your neurons are not really up to the task, then it's very difficult to be at your best. And in this core element, it's really important to look at sleep, your sleep pattern. It looks also how you deal with stress in general. Then also, how do you energize yourself? How do you structure your day to be really at your best? You are not able to work eight hours nonstop. I, I believe, John, with all your academic background, you have worked for hours. Um, <laughs> but, but from own experiences, you know, at a certain point, 
there's not much of productivity coming out of that. So, and I completely agree, by the way. Um, this is actually a, a comment and a question I get fairly often. I tend to be a pretty organized and productive person. And so I, I strictly hold to the, the idea that, you know, I'm not going to just burn the candle at both ends. I'm not going to work endless hours. And I want to devote time to my family. I want to devote time to help, uh, plenty of sleep and recreation. And so I just try to, the times when I'm working, I try to focus uh, and be very productive in those chunks of time. Uh, and then I try to have a, a balanced, integrated, you know, work life. And uh, that's worked pretty well for me. I completely agree that, you know, working, uh, you know, the, the average person really can't focus for more than three or four hours a day tops anyways. And so working 10, 12 plus hour days isn't really going to be very fruitful for most people. Yeah. And this is, a, a, by the way, something I do with most of my clients in one or two sessions, just to look at their whole day. How do they outline their day? I have, for example, someone who works for a consultancy firm. This means taking work also home. She is a single mother. She has two kids, so she also has to help the kids. And therefore, it's even more important that even during the way, uh, work time, the consultancy firm that she structures really her day, targeting her main things and also have some breaks in between because there was a time she had one meeting after the other and in the end she didn't know what she even discussed with one person and she felt totally exhausted and also to look what you can like let go of like uh, for, for example some people they don't take uh, enough good nutrition because there's no time to cook and then all these people are really earning very, very well. And then I said, so to be very productive and to have a really good lifestyle, you need to get either a cook, someone who comes in, who cooks like on two days, cooks for the week, cooks even for, for the family. And this was for some people really a game changer. They never thought about such an idea. They said, yeah, uh, it doesn't need that you are starving yourself because most of them are actually starving themselves. And uh, they are catering services. Yeah, if you're a single person, yeah, like so small, small things. And with sleep, it's also very easy to say, yeah, you have to sleep. But, but sometimes there are some things that hinder you to sleep. This can be stress levels, this can be hormonal changes and therefore it's even important if you don't if your sleep hygiene is already set yeah there are certain things cold room fully dark you should go to bed before 11 you should not expose yourself to light after 10 p.m too much if everything is that uh, everything is right and it's still not working then I always recommend to, to really go to a medical doctor and see what's the underlying issue of that. Yeah, because without yeah. sleep, you can't function. And this is one of the major things I really highly recommend. I also use tapping. There is a method called uh, EFT. And uh, for some people, it really helps. Yeah, it's like a ritual. It's like you stimulate the brain uh, on certain points and give affirmations and you regulate your system down. For some people, it really works. For some, not. So therefore, I say you really have to weigh everything. Yeah, that's yeah. for me really the basic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and that's, that is very, very important. And really the, the, the healthy sleep patterns, the, the, um, the diet and the food that you take into your body, the exercise, all of those things, uh, really feed into many of these five areas, perhaps all five of the, the core yeah. elements of human potential. Um, let's go ahead and break further down each yeah. of the five yes. individually, starting with the okay. first. Let's uh, go now to emotional agility. 
And this is uh, where everything becomes really very interesting because uh, we don't think when we are in business or in management, we don't think about emotions. But as you know, neuroscience has uh, really studied that with every decision we do, we need emotions. There has to be like an emotional arousal in our body. And an emotion is a body sensation in our body. And then a feeling is more like on a higher region of the brain in the insula. We interpret it, whatever we are feeling in our body. And this interpretation is called a feeling. And it's very important that we learn how to label what is going on in our body very well because this defines how we are acting afterwards. So if we are label as something as very fearful and we are fearful about it, then we can only take certain actions because the brain is predicting what will come next when we have already something established. So if we believe it's, it's fear and we label it fear, there's a certain program we are running. If we define it as excitement, yeah, it's the same similar arousal in the body, but I define it as excitement, then I will have another repertoire of actions that I can follow on. The same is with intuition. Is it an impulse I'm following? Because uh, I, I, I for example, I, I fear or I worry that when I do a certain decision, I would regret it or I'm very uncertain about it. And then I act more out of an impulse and not intuitively. And intuitively means based on my experiences. And this is then more like the executive functioning of the brain where I access previous things, how I dealt with them, and then how I would predict based on certain information. But if I act out of an impulse, then I may use the wrong emotions in my decision making. So this is all the whole field of emotions. And I also go with some clients deeper to look why I'm reacting in a certain way in specific situations. And then we go even back in time uh, into childhood and see when a certain feeling pattern or emotional pattern was created and then heal it and go back to the same scene as an adult. Yeah, so it, yeah. In this emotional work, we work like what's going on now. That's more on the neuroscience way and coaching way. But sometimes with some clients, it's also important to go back in time and, and see the root source of that. Yeah. And, and we all have our own emotional baggage, don't we? Um, and we, we yeah. have coping mechanisms and patterns that we've established over time, some of them healthy, a lot of them not so healthy. And so going through that process of, of really trying to understand where we're coming from, why we're feeling what we're feeling, how we're processing it, um, that's all very important. And you know, as you mentioned, the emotional agility is, is a key component. It's one of those five core elements. Um, how about the social and the spiritual agility? Yeah, so the social agility means how do I interact in social settings? And in this, what I also often realize that people uh, I'm interacting in a workplace can be also representative for people of my past. Yeah, for example, I had people, they always had problems with their boss or the CEO or whatever higher position and and when we dig a little bit deeper then we realize okay this person is actually representing a parent yeah and then I, I I'm somehow stuck 
in my old patterns that I had when, when I, I was a younger person at that time. What also uh, social interaction means that uh, you are also able to really reflect what is going on. When there is a conflict, we tend to find on a surface level to solve the problem immediately. And we don't go under the surface what kind of emotional load is underlying there. And people are not really expressing what the real problem is. And therefore often a, a conflict can't be solved. So this comes, we, we are going into the area of vulnerability. And for me, vulnerability means to really express what I'm feeling. It's uh, in a certain context, uh, I could say, in fact, I don't feel comfortable with that. In fact, I feel very uncertain. I feel not seen. I, I, I feel that my arguments are not seen. So what I'm expressing is I, yeah? And with this I, I reflect what I'm feeling in that or what I'm sensing in this very moment. And when I open up to this, the whole conversation can go into a totally different direction. Yeah, excellent. I love it. How about spiritual? Spiritual is... Um, in this context to really see what is your life's mission and this is for for me then more the spiritual level often in companies we uh, they have their mission and vision and of it's often it's mixed up but the mission is to follow your core values for what are you standing for what part of the world are you representing what part of the world you want to create an impact in and if this becomes really clear for you what your life's purpose what your highest meaning in life is then you can align everything else under it then you can say okay if i'm part of a world for example in my case it's wise counsel this is uh, my mission it's my philosophy and if i have this then i can say okay if i if this is my mission what could be a vision where could i uh, act out my mission i could work what i did even be before in the educational sector i could be a psychotherapist i could be a mentor there are different options, different visions, how I can live my mission. And then I can also structure very easily what are my values, what are my core beliefs when I have this mission, what kind of skills would I need for this, and how would I act? What is then actions that are objective and that can be measured, and what is the best environment for me? That's a typical alignment exercise from NLP, but it's very, very powerful. The moment you have found your mission and align everything under it, and then you walk up your way, I always say, then people are coming out of that really, how can you say, really content. They know what it means and they can change environment they can change the vision and then create a new alignment to to that yeah i love it so th those five core elements all these different forms of agility uh you you've explained those so well and laid those out for us so as i mentioned in the the introduction clearly this applies to me as an individual uh, you as an individual, all of us as we interact with our families, friends, communities, etc. But it also certainly applies to how we interact with others in the workplace. And I'm a believer that one of the core roles of a leader is to help their people fulfill their potential. So if as a leader, that's one of my goals is to 
fulfill my own potential and help those around me to fulfill their potential, to have a dynamic team where everyone feels empowered to become their best full authentic self. How do I then as a leader help to model these five elements in how I live, how I work, and also how do I support my people in developing the, these different forms of agility as well? That's a very, very good question. So in the first place, how you model it, it it's really what a lot of people are saying. You always lead from within. If you are aligned, if you are able to regulate your emotions, because what you represent will be also picked up by the people in your team. I had, for example, once a, a boss, he, his health was not the very best. He was very narcissistic. He really didn't involve anybody from the team. He was the big player. If you didn't uh, go along with him, you were blamed. And this created a very toxic environment compared to, to someone who is really in line with himself, who knows how he or she is feeling, know how to regulate it, how know what her or his meaning is, then this will be very visible in the whole environment you create. How you can install that uh, in your employees is to really figure out what their mission is, what are they aiming for, what are their strengths. This is always, I say, that's so important for a leader to figure out intuitively, to see, okay, someone is really good in this and this, and there are also tests someone can use to provide for employers to really find out their core strength, and then to see how the workplace or the task can be aligned to the core strength of someone. So, sometimes people are not using their core strengths and then apply other things and then productivity is good, but could be better if, uh, if it would be more aligned what they're really aiming for. And to find us in career development or personal development to find out what really their core mission is. Yeah, and then you can also align this person accordingly. For me, these are the two core elements when it comes to coaching people in your team. Yeah, Finding thank you. Finding the core strength and support. Yeah, and, and coming back to what you said just a minute ago, modeling first from leading from within, uh, this means a variety of things, right? This means that I need to model healthy work-life balance, work-life integration, that I need to take my physical and mental health seriously, uh, in that I need to be vulnerable enough with my people to, to let them see, you know, that it's something that I'm prioritizing in that sometimes, you know, I may not be on my A game and that's okay, that I need support sometimes just like I'm going to try to support them. You create an, a psychologically safe environment, an environment where everyone knows that they can truly bring their whole self to work and that they're going to be supported in that. Uh, that then creates this, this uh, context in which we can start to, to really better understand our own, uh, really how we function within these different five areas of agility and we can understand better where perhaps we might be lacking and perhaps where we might be able to grow and develop and, and really lean into our full uh, potential and our, our full authentic self. So I, I think all of that is super fascinating, super important. Um, it's easier said than done though, because it requires vulnerability. It requires continuous um, self-reflection and uh, introspect, introspection, and it requires uh, the development of meaningful, mutual, and authentic relationships of mutual accountability and trust, right? That we, I need to know my people well enough that they see me when I'm vulnerable, that I can see that they can have permission to be vulnerable and that they trust me, you know, to not uh, try to utilize their vulnerability yes. for my gain, right? Yes. 
Yes, and uh, I fully agree with you. And, and you see in the last year's management positions have been really reduced. So nowadays, if you're a leader, you have much more responsibilities and the stake of your work is higher than ever before. And, and therefore, I think it's a totally new game on, on leadership right now. And it requires more human capital for what you say. You as a human being really have not need to, but, but it would be important if you really reach your whole human potential and that you go through that first on your own so that you can en enable others. And, and you know, new generations are much more vulnerable. So they're not going through the high stake like our generation or the millennials. They want, they're much more emotional, open. They, they really want to have a work-life balance. And some consultancy firms like PricewaterCoopers, they implemented a concept, work well, think well, what was it? think well, feel well, work well. Um, where even team leaders, they what you mentioned before, they have to be a role model. They have to go for a lunch break. Yeah, if, if they are not going for a lunch break, the other won't, won't also go for it. And they do like um, uh, certain goals per week on what kind of area you want to focus on for your emotional and mental well-being. And it's shared in the whole group. And of course, it's not working in every team, but in, in teams where the leader is open, it works very well. And it yeah. has really consequences on performance and well-being. Yeah, yeah, it does. Well, Silk, it has just been a real pleasure talking with you. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a moment, but before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about your work and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Great. Yes, you can find me on LinkedIn under my profile, Silk Lab. I post a lot. It's a very com comprehensive profile. And then over my website, brainbossmethod.com. And uh, there you can go through it and you can also book a free consultation session to really feel and see if this method is the right one for your current situation. And what I wanted to say is that there is a reason why I call it the brain boss method, because everything what you're doing is in your brain and become a boss of your brain. And this includes everything what we discussed today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Silk and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.